Hello everyone and welcome to your week four lecture on mental health. All right, so we will begin. I'll just see if the sh um, screen is being shared. So um, PowerPoint slideshow, share. All right, we are good to go. Okay, so um, again, you have a couple of pre-readings which are in, in the um, style of your PowerPoint slides. So please do go through those. They are pretty simple. And um, once you have done your pre-readings, then yes, uh, we'll be starting with the main lecture on mental health and um, I'll be covering from this slide onwards. All right, so the three main types of uh, mental health um, conditions that we will be reviewing for today's lecture is anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. There are various other types of um, diagnostic feeding disorders as well um, in relationship to mental health and they are from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, okay, DSM. All right, but we will be looking at these three and then will be specifically majority of the lecture will focus on key nutrients and its association with um, mental health. Okay, so that's going to be the main focus of today's lecture, the pathophysiological association be behind key nutrients and mental health. Okay, so we'll start from anorexia nervosa. So generally speaking, what is anorexia nervosa? It is severe restriction of energy intake, which leads to a significant low body weight. All right, so the BMI is very, very low. And um, what does it encompass? It encompasses various types of purging behavior. Purging behavior are um, a combination of, say, vomiting, misuse of laxative, diuretics, and excessive exercise. So you have um, restricted energy expenditure, um, energy intake, excessive energy expenditure, plus this is combined with purging effect, okay, which is vomiting. And um, so you um, basically the um, underlying psychology behind this is by vomiting, use of lax laxative, diuretics, you're trying to eliminate as much as um, say fluid and fecal content from the body and the psyche being that would like um, result in low body weight status. Okay, so definitely there is an underlying fear of gaining weight, becoming fat and negative self-evaluation of body image. All right, so with bulimia nervosa, the, um, the biggest difference over here is with bulimia nervosa, you have binging episodes and binging episodes are followed with compensatory behaviors. All right, CB. So binging episodes roughly, if binging is happening at least um, once per week for continuously for three months, this is a red flag. Okay, so this is just a red flag that probably this behavior needs further investigation. All right, so um, what does bulimia nervosa encompass, which is eating larger than normal amount of foods, eating within two hours of the last meal which has been consumed, then lacking a, a sense, um, lack of control, a sense of lack of control while eating, um, and feeling guilty while eating, all right, um, eating, binging in secrets, in secrecy. All right, so basically these are the types of say characteristics or behavioral patterns in binging. And after the binging event, this is followed by compensatory behavior. Again, if compensatory behavior followed by binging is at least once a week for continuously three months, this is a red flag. All right, then you have, um, again, you have purging behavior over here as well, which is say vomiting, misuse of laxative, diuretics, all right, and this could be accompanied with excessive exercise. But if you see in bulim anorexia nervosa, the main thing is, um, say, absolute restriction of, say, dietary intake. Okay, over here, you have a binging episode, so excessive dietary intake, and then followed with compensatory behavior. Of course, um, the underlying um, condition includes negative self-evaluation of body image. All right, so now with compensatory uh, behavior, this is roughly the diagnostic pattern. All right, this is not set in stone, but if you see mild bulimia nervosa, you have one to three episodes of binging plus compensatory behavior per week. Now imagine extreme is more than 14 episodes of binging plus compensatory behavior per week. All right, this is not a healthy, say, sign of, um, say, eating and dietary pattern or even um, say the psyche of losing weight or maintaining weight, all right, or body shape. The um, classic sign which is seen in say uh, bulimia nervosa is Russell's 
sign all right so what is russell sign and why does this happen guys basically uh, while vomiting while i'm um, say trying to vomit um, or induce vomiting i have to say okay so um, the um, individual may try to say um, put their uh, fingers down their throat which would then give you that gagging reflex all right and cont continuously doing this meaning you're scraping your knuckles on the upper palate of your mouth on your teeth all right and then you have um, the gastric hcl which comes over your um, fingers and um, your knuckles as well and obviously your mouth all right so this is causing this erosion okay these signs of erosion not generalizing it but um, if you have seen um, very high top notch uh, models say for example who are running in fashion week and things like that couple of them if you see not that uh, the sign means that they are bulimic but um, yes you do see couple of them uh, with say these kind of knuckles but again that doesn't equal to don't just assume because someone has a a scratch on their knuckle meaning uh, yes they must be bulimic no um, it's just that I've, as i said holistically if you see many red flags then yes this warrants further investigation okay so yes russell sign is where you have this erosion of your knuckles all right okay and then you have this is very important guys um in the unit of your nutrition and disease which is to understand the pathophysiological mechanism behind bulevia nervosa and anorexia nervosa okay so now we'll gradually go through um these um, signs and symptoms okay so you have um your um, salivary gland which is enlarged why is it enlarged because of all that excessive vomiting imagine if an individual is vomiting more than 14 times in a week okay induced vomiting this is definitely going to enlarge your salivary gland because if you must have noticed even when um, you had um, say vomited uh, it um, induces a lot of saliva okay so your mouth is say filled with saliva when you feel like vomiting okay so yes you do have enlarged salivary glands then you have enamel erosion why do you have enamel erosion which is enamel on your teeth because of all this excessive vomiting you have your stomach hcl which is coming through your esophagus through your mouth and all that acidic environment is eroding your teeth okay because your mouth doesn't have an acidic environment okay the ph of your mouth is not acidic all right then you have esophagitis now this meaning inflammation so why do you have inflammation of the esophageal lining again for the same reason because of excessive hcl which is passing through your stomach through your esophagus and then your mouth okay so you can have erosion of your inner lining of your cheek inflammation um, of your um, esophagus all because of excessive vomiting hcl the acidic content all right then you have arrhythmias which is irregular heartbeat why do you have irregular heartbeat essentially you have it because of hypokalemia okay meaning low potassium so i'm hovering my mouse over there so why do you have low potassium because of all this vomiting plus you have excessive diuretic meaning the individual is peeing a lot excessively all right so all that vomiting plus diuretic peeing a lot is causing a fluid imbalance okay so um, you're losing a lot of electrolytes particularly potassium and when you lose a lot of potassium this can even result hypokalemia can result into irregular heartbeats and therefore you have arrhythmias okay then the individual the bulimic individual um, is um, highly likely to be say an um, normal weight or even say slightly overweight or underweight basically the bulimic individual um, generally speaking is not reduced to skin and bones okay so is not skeleton looking all right then you have calluses russell sign okay so you have constant erosion and then you have skin which is forming on it okay so that's why you have the calluses formation so this is russell signs and now you know why all right then you have biochemical changes so what are your biochemical changes as i said you have hypokalemia and now you know why hypokalemia because you are losing a lot of fluid by vomiting and by diuretics guys when i'm explaining you like this for example if you have an um if you have a question like this in your exam the short answers which you have in your final exam you are required to write these underlined reasons okay not just hypokalemia why hypokalemia okay not just enamel erosion why enamel erosion okay so all of that is not there in the slide all of that is there over here in me and that's why i'm like talking it out okay so when i speak all of this when you are preparing for your exam go back to these recordings listen to what i have to say 
this will help you form a stronger answer okay so i speak a lot which is not there on the slide all right and that's why it is important for you to register those notes and therefore the recordings are available so you can go back and forth and you can register it well all right okay otherwise it's impractical to write all of that on the slide it just makes the slide so cumbersome that what is the point of lecture if every single thing which i have to say is on the slide okay then you don't need a lecture all right you just need research papers and you can learn from research papers because i'm not asking you to read research papers i'm reading all of those research papers registering them in my head so then i can explain it to you in simple language so it has to come out somewhere right okay so i hope you appreciate it but uh, basically you will have to say give the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms which may not be there in every slide all right so um then you have high carbon dioxide now i'll come to that point why do you have high carbon dioxide just over here you have high salivary amylase so salivary amylase is the enzyme which is secreted in your saliva okay so amylase is uh, in general um terms salivary amylase is used for breaking down of carbohydrates so basically your carbohydrate digestion starts um in the mouth itself okay with salivary amylase but over here you have high salivary amylase because of all this vomiting because of the enlarged salivary glands therefore you have this um, high salivaries okay high salivary amylase all right and then you have um, yes um, diarrhea is a symptom why because of all that excessive um, say laxatives which the individual is having so the individual is having a binging episode so there is food which is going into the gastrointestinal tract and of course it has to come out and all that laxative meaning diarrhea all right then you have edema why do you have edema over here edema is principally because of the electrolyte imbalance okay so when you have this low potassium for instance this can result into edema all right so over here remember in bulimia nervosa the underlying reason for edema is electrolyte imbalance such as hypokalemia or low potassium all right so that is one of the reasons so there are many many pathophysiological mechanisms guys as i have told you in the lecture one the key ones which i cite to you are the ones which have been explored the most okay so now guys for this slide the notes section will be very useful for you so um hang on i don't know why this has stopped sharing the screen and now you can just look at my face but don't worry you don't have to look at me all the time and get scared <laughs> i hope you can see this now i'll just reshare it with you guys so this is the powerpoint here yeah. um i wanted i why i have shared the powerpoint with you guys is because i want to go to this notes section okay so now you know how i said over here you have high carbon dioxide now i'll come to the point why you have high carbon dioxide okay so now let's let me just again um widen this notes section all right okay so please do look at this underlying notes section especially for this slide because um these underlying reasons for these pathophysiological signs and symptoms will make more sense to you all right so now in bulimia if you see overall i'll go very slowly okay so patients who purge by vomiting okay patients who are doing excessive vomiting all right in comparison to say using laxative or diuretics okay so they are doing excessive vomiting okay so they are purging by vomiting so their compensatory behavior is more vomiting rather than using laxatives and diuretics so in this case these patients may present metabolic alkalosis okay alkalosis meaning you have high sodium uh, uh, the um, say bicarbonate ions not sodium bicarbonate the bicarbonate ions okay hco3 all right so now why do you have elevated bicarbonate ions okay so why because now if you see these this is constant okay so this is happening over a period of time the stomach capacity is decreasing the stomach capacity is um, say it's constricting all right you have a contraction of your stomach volume the stomach capacity all right and therefore um in opposition you have those um, bicarbonate levels which are increasing the bicarbonate levels you have the bicarbonate secretion is maximum in your intestinal tract okay so your intestinal tract doesn't have an acidic environment it has a basic environment okay so you have high bicarbonate levels in your intestinal tract 
okay so now with so much of vomiting so much of vomiting you are you are losing a lot of hcl okay you're losing a lot of this acidic environment your because of this constant vomiting your stomach size and volume capacity is decreasing because how much ever hcl it is secreting you're losing a lot of it by vomiting all right so overall you have less acidic environment now because of all that vomiting and the ratio of your bicarbs is increasing okay and therefore high serum bicarbonate levels now when you have high serum bicarbonate levels this can lead to high co2 levels as well all right so now uh, the other point over here you have and see this uh, this point i should probably take this now that i'm doing it i'll just do it over here for you okay so all your metabolic alkalosis points are covered together so basically the second point is just about this guys that metabolic alkalosis okay it is the primary increase in bicarbonate ion which is what i told you it's co3 all right and then um, you are highly likely over here it says with or without say carbon dioxide increase but in a bulimic patient generally metabolic alkalosis is is accompanied with an increase in carbon dioxide levels all right and therefore in the diagram you have high co2 all right so i hope this makes sense guys okay so basically um, lots of vomiting you are losing a lot of your acidic um, environment which is your hcl okay your stomach volume and your capacity is con contracting all right in ratio in comparison you have your bicarb ions which are increasing all right when bicarb ion increase you have high co2 as well okay and therefore the high co2 in the diagram now the other thing which you can also have is patients um who are abusing or practicing compensatory behaviors using excessive amount of laxatives okay so now when you have lots of laxatives then what is happening with lots of laxative meaning lots of diarrhea okay so you're losing a lot of fluid via diarrhea and diarrhea as you know it comes out of your intestinal tract at the end right large intestinal tract recum anus okay so basically you're losing a lot of bicarb ions all right so what is happening you have decreased serum bicarbonate levels okay because you are losing a lot of bicarbonate ions you are practically dehydrating your gi tract okay because you are losing all of that fluid through diarrhea all right so then what do you have in comparison the other ratio which increases is high metabolic acidosis all right and therefore they have high metabolic acidosis um if they are using a lot of laxatives all right some individuals do both of the things okay meaning high um, vomiting high laxative in this case you can have mixed acid base findings all right and in this case you are very likely to not have high co2 as well okay but um, yes this is what i wanted to tell you the key things about bulimia so i have covered all of these points okay this is just an additional reference from where i got additional material all right so guys i have covered all of these points to explain to you why you may see high co2 okay high co2 may be a result of metabolic alkalosis but you can also see metabolic acidosis in these individuals all right so now moving on to anorexia all right so i will just um, keep the screen like this because we again have to go to the notes section all right so now in anorexia you see um um dizziness and confusion why do you see dizziness and confusion is because the individual is currently in a hypometabolic state okay your brain the majority source of say the main source of energy to your brain is glucose okay the individual is not eating in the first place okay hypoglycemia when you are experiencing hypoglycemia you must have seen you feel dizzy you feel confused you don't feel best right so that is what happening to this individual at a chronic stage very hypoglycemic individual this in person is okay so yes you have dizziness and confusion one of the many reasons as to why you may have dizziness and confusion okay then you have dry brittle hair okay so why do you have dry brittle hair because of micronutrient deficiencies predominantly what are the micronutrients which are uh, very important for your hair for example and you may have seen multivitamin supplements for the same you have vitamin a you have folic acid you have zinc all of this is say considered your hair nail 
um, micronutrients. Okay, so yes, because of micronutrient deficiency, and of course because of overall protein deficiency as well. All right, then you have um, lang languco. I I can never say this word. Okay, so basically you have these um, tiny curly little hair which are forming all over the individual's body. Okay, why are they forming all over the individual's body? So you have a lot of facial hair. You have a lot of hair, um, say these tiny little curly hair all over the body. Why? Because the body wants to, um, the body doesn't have enough fat to, pro, uh, to um, act as an insulator. Okay. When it doesn't have that system, it tries to form these tiny little hairs so it can retain more heat. Okay. So the body, for the body to preserve heat, it starts growing these um, abnormal looking hair. Okay. They are tiny and they are curly in nature. All right, then you have um, low blood pressure, pulse, okay, and you have the ECG reading is low as well. Okay, so basically you have something which is called as bradycardia, okay, so low blood pressure. Why? Because the individual is in a hypometabolic state, all right, meaning when you have seen the obesity lecture we covered, when you have severe restriction of energy, what is the first thing which happens? Your restic metabolic rate goes down, meaning the energy which is spent for all involuntary activities okay such as beating of heart digestion absorption um say a uh, maintaining of your reproductive organs such as menstruation all right so all of these goes down the functioning of all of your involuntary um functioning is compromised production of your rbc wbc hemoglobin all right wear and tear of skin everything is compromised in a hypometabolic condition. Why do you have a hypometabolic condition? Because you have a low resting metabolic rate. Why do you have a low resting metabolic rate? Because the individual is not consuming sufficient amount of calories, severe calorie constriction. So guys, this is what is very important. You cannot memorize such thing as I have said, emphasizing this again in a long run, okay? You need to understand the underlying reasons the more you understand the underlying reasons, this will become very easy to you, okay? So please, the emphasis again, understand the underlying reasons. All right, then you have orthostatus, which is again, low blood pressure. I think I have all of this written over here for you. Um, yes, I have, okay, hypotension, yeah. So low blood pressure, uh, orthostatus, again, why? Because it's a hypometabolic condition, okay? So in hypometabolic condition, um, we will come to that in the um, diagram. You have slowed down deep tendon reflexes. Okay, so for example, your tendons and your joints, for instance, um, if you hit the pain you should be feeling and the reflex which you should be getting, that is all slowed down. Okay, because your neurotransmittery function is also affected and it is impaired. All right, you have hypotension. As I said, it is orthostatus. Okay, it is because of hypermetabolic condition, bradycardia, again, because of hypermetabolic condition. All right, hypermetabolic condition meaning decreased peristaltic mo movements, okay, peristaltic movements of your GI tract and therefore of your intestine as well. And therefore, you have uh, you experience a lot of constipation. First, predominant reason, guys, to experience constipation for anorexic patient is because they have severe caloric restriction. If nothing is going in, what will come out? Okay, it's like the basic equation, all right? Because they are not eating enough, not much is coming out, all right? So that is the first thing. Second, you have a low peristaltic movement of your gastrointestinal tract, therefore constipation, all right? Then because it's a hypometabolic condition, cold intolerance, they feel very, very cold, okay? They feel cold all of the time. And of course, the other um, response for the body, because the body naturally does not want to die of hypothermia, it starts producing these um, small little, those hairs, which I told you, tiny hairs, okay, all over the body, all right? Hypermetabolic condition, meaning what do you have? Cessation of your, um, say, unnecessary functions. The body considers that as unnecessary functions in a hypometabolic state, such as menstruation. Basically, essentially, for in um, humans, why do you menstruate? Because it's a reproductive functional capacity, all right, to um, produce offsprings. Body is like, look, I want to survive. I can't think about getting a baby and all. So yes, let's stop uh, menstruation. Okay, so hypometabolism can result in a lot of these things, all right? So now again, going to this one. So yes, uh, we spoke about, yes, orthostatus, 
and then cachexia. What is cachexia? When you're losing a lot of your lean muscle mass, okay? So you're literally turning into skin and bones. You can see the ribs, you can see the clavicle bone, all right? So when you can see um, those body parts really skinny, okay, that is called as cachexia, all right? Um, so yes, cachexia, um, individual losing a lot of lean muscle mass um, because not eating enough protein deficiency, all right? And therefore you have um, say um, the symptoms of cachexia, where the individual is looking skeleton types. All right, then what are the biochemical changes you have? You have low WBCs again because the body is like, um, okay, I'm a, in a hypermetabolic state. I have to preserve my energy as much as possible. So your immune function is the last thing that the body can think. Okay, there are many, many other things which has which it has to do, which is often essential, but even that is pretty slow, like beating of your heart. Okay, you know, if your heart stops, that's it. All right. So those basic functions are compromised. So say your immune system being top-notch is definitely not going to happen. Okay, so you have low WBC production, low hemoglobin production, low RBC production because of your hypermetabolic condition. All right, then you have low um, glucose. So basically guys in this, um, in um, anorexic patient, you can have compromise of your um, liver functioning as well. And you know, liver is such a strong metabolic organ for us, right? So in liver, you have a lot of glucose metabolism taking place. And because of that, you have low glucose, but that is not the first reason. The very, very first reason is, as I said, you don't eat enough. Obviously, if you don't eat enough, you are going to be hypoglycemic. What does hypoglycemic mean? Low blood sugar levels. Okay, so yes, they have low blood sugar levels predominantly because there is like hardly any dietary intake. The second thing is because of compromised liver functioning. All right. Then you have high cholesterol and high uh, uh, carotene levels. Okay, or beta carotene levels, which is your vegetarian form of vitamin A. All right. So firstly, why do you have high cholesterol? I have written over here. Okay, so high LDL. Firstly, remember that um, your, one of your strongest metabolic organ is your liver, all right? And your liver is not functioning well, okay? And uh, your liver is um, thinking that the individual is not eating enough. Obviously, I'm not getting any fat in the diet because um, the biggest notion that they have no fat in diet as well, right? Individuals who may be, um, say, suffering from this condition. So the first thing which they do is fat restriction. So you have excessive endogenous production of, say, your cholesterol, okay, in the body. And uh, why would you have, so you have high cholesterol, basically, because of excessive production of, say, endogenous cholesterol. And let me see if it's there in the diagram. Is it there? Oh, yes, it's there. Good. So yes, so you have high cholesterol because of excessive endogenous production of cholesterol, because your body's trying to sustain by itself. You're not eating much in the diet, all right? And then if you see over here, I have one more, made one more point, which is high LDL specifically. Why do you have high LDL? Low levels of estrogen, okay? As I said, reproductive organs is the least thing what your body could be bothered about. Maintaining your reproductive hormones such as estrogen, your body couldn't be concerned. It's in a hypometabolic state, all right? So you have low estrogen level and you have low thyroid hormone levels like your T3. All right, your thyroid stimulating hormones. Okay, so when your metabolic hormones are disturbed, all right, this can result in high LDL. Okay, so low estrogen level and thyroid, low thyroid hormones can result in LDL level. You, I don't know, but if you have seen um, it, women who um, say undergo menopause, where um, organically, then you will have less production of estrogen with time because the woman is undergoing menopause and um, say is... Um, um, their periods have stopped, okay, so in simple terms. So basically in this individuals also you will have low estrogen levels. Now they are at a high risk of say hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia, okay. So like in males, if you see the uh, probability of dyslipidemia is much more greater, all right, but once a woman reaches menopause because of low estrogen level, which is say a natural protective factor in us, all right, again, say cardiovascular condition and um, say dyslipidemia, but now that is compromised once your estrogen level goes down all right so therefore the risk of say cardiovascular diseases at an epidemiological epidemiological level is much more higher among males than females okay because we have a natural protection against it because of our estrogen level but over here that is compromised okay so you have high cholesterol 
because of liver malfunctioning and because your body is trying to sustain itself you have high ldl because of low estrogen low thyroid hormone all right and um, yes this can uh, contribute to say high levels of low density uh, lipoprotein all right then the other thing which you have as i said your liver is not functioning well okay so you have decreased excretion of bile acids and decreased turnover overall turnover of cholesterol in the body okay so you have decreased say production and excretion of bile acids with bile you know like these cholesterol are eliminated out of the body okay but there is no production of bile because your liver functioning is impaired all right and um, yes decreased turnover of overall cholesterol which is they say the synthesis excretion synthesis excretion all of this is impaired because your liver is not functioning well all right um, because your liver is not functioning well guys you could see hypoalbuminemia okay so hypoalbuminemia meaning where you have albumin as a protein you have less synthesis of your albumin protein all right because of liver functioning because liver is the critical site for the production of albumin all right because you have low albumin levels you see edema okay so over here edema in this diagram that is because of hypoalbuminemia why do you have hypoalbuminemia because liver is the site for production of the same but liver cannot synthesize it to the sufficient quantity all right because liver fu uh, functioning is compromised all right so i hope guys all of these make sense all right now i see yes i forgot to tell you about high beta carotene levels all right so let me go over here again okay so you have high beta carotene levels so basically your carotene as i said is the vegetarian form of vitamin a so carotene is converted in the body to vitamin a which is your retinol okay and um, this conversion is impaired because firstly liver functioning is impaired so in the liver you have the conversion of um, beta carotene to retinol vitamin a this is impaired because of liver functioning being impaired and there is a second mechanism the second mechanism is that you have high ldl lipoproteins okay your ldl your that bad cholesterol and now we know why we have high ldl okay because you have a lot of ldl which is floating in the blood okay they are the main carriers of carotene in the plasma okay so they would say um, it's like their taxi like you know how you have insulin as a taxi for glucose similarly over here you have your uh, basically what is it ldl as a taxi for your carotene all right so because you have so much of ldl you have a lot of carotene which is say carried by this ldl and therefore it is hypothesized that increase in ldl is often observed in anorexic patient and this may explain hypercarotinemia okay so serum ldl they are the main carriers of carotene in the plasma because unfortunately you can convert it to retinol this all carotene is lying in the blood and it is floating with all of this ldl all right um the second hypothesis which is not very well accepted and there is a lot of controversy around it but it's just an fyi okay which is um because anorexic individuals they are trying to say cut down their caloric intake so what they may do is um say go say big on eating um just say yellow orange fruits and veggies like eating carrot because it has hardly any calories all right so um because they are just uh, eating that whenever they are asked to eat or forced to eat they say this can contribute to say high carotene levels as well but this theory as i said is not really well accepted all right the more predominant reasons are poor conversion of beta carotene into retinol high ldl which is say a carrier for uh, beta carotene in the plasma okay in the blood all right so that's why you have high beta carotene level stool retention because of a hypometabolic condition poor peristaltic movement therefore you have constipation or stool retention you have acrocyanosis where is um, it's called as say blue color nails and fingers okay why do you have blue color nails and fingers again i have it over here blueness of your extremities okay because why low blood pressure all right when your blood pressure is low you know the um, thing which happens you have vasoconstriction okay when you have vasoconstriction this leads to poor circulation because there is naturally um, low amount of say oxygen saturation in the blood of an anorexic patient there is low amount of nutrient carrying capacity all right so there is less amount of blood reaching the extremities and therefore they ex um, therefore they look bluish in color okay cyanosis cyanosis like blue 
All right. So because they are not getting the sufficient amount of oxygen and nutrients because of vasoconstriction, they appear blue. Why are they vasoconstricted? Is um, because, as I said, that you have a hypometabolic condition, low blood pressure. Therefore, all right. Okay. Loss of menses, and now you know why. You have muscle wasting, which is nothing but cachexia. All right. Then you have diminishing uh, deep tendon reflexes, and now you know why as well. Then you have osteoporosis. Obviously, you will have osteoporosis because there is literally hardly any intake of calcium in the body. So yes, that is one of the key reasons for osteoporosis as well. Okay. Then you have dry skin. As I said, this is because of nutritional deficiency. <coughs> Edema, as I said, is because of hypoalbuminemia. Um, growth retardation because of overall nutrition deficiency. Hypothermia, but of course, there is hardly any fat for insulation. Okay, so yes, guys, this slide looks some um, really um, just one slide, but the content which I have covered is like equal to say 10 slides. Okay, so there are a lot of pathophysiological mechanisms behind anorexia and bulimia nervosa. Okay, guys, so um, yep, let's move further. Let me see if I'm sharing the PowerPoint um, slideshow. Slideshow, slideshow. Yep. So I hope you can see this. Let me just confirm again. I'm always a bit paranoid about this, guys, because once um, it so happened that I was doing a recording like this and um, I forgot to switch the slides and the poor students, they could just see one dumb slide and I kept on talking. Um, they were really sweet. They didn't complain, but um, that made me feel even more responsible. Um, to not do a careless mistake like this. So I try to be very mindful. Of course, um, I'm a human and errors can happen, but um, let's try to be mindful, right? So you don't have the same problems. Okay, guys. So, um, yep. Now we are going on to um, binge eating disorders. All right. So now with binge eating disorder, guys, it's the same thing. The main thing, the individual is binging over here, which as I said, the red flag could be say at least once. Um, per week for say approximately three months, but this is not followed by a compensatory behavior. So there is no vomiting or no purging behavior. So purging is a combination of um, say vomiting and or laxative and or diuretics. All right. So yes, you have um, binge eating episodes, um, larger than normal amounts of food within two hours, um, feel like you have um, say limited control over it. Um, when you start eating, you feel that you are helpless. You just can't stop eating, um, eating more rapidly than normal, say eating until uncomfortable, like you can hardly breathe, then eating large amounts, even though you're not hungry, um, eating alone and eating especially core foods and discretionary foods within this sort of a binge eating episode and setting. All right. Um, and of course, feeling guilty after this as well. So these are all of the, um, say, complex um, behaviors which are associated with binge eating disorder. Then um, again, the classification is the same, guys, as um, your bulimia nervosa. Okay, so I won't go into it again. It's exactly the same. Then now, guys, as I said, the uh, majority of the lecture is around what are the key nutrients which have been well explored in the literature, all right? And what are their mechanisms for its association with mental health in general, okay? So when we talk about mental health, it could be say um, depression, anxiety, stress, bipolar disorders, schizophrenic um, episodes, all of those, okay? But let's look at the key nutrients that have been investigated, all right? So majority of the nutrients that have been investigated, the most common one, the most well-researched one is omega-3 fatty acids, okay? Then comes your B-complex vitamins and then specific amino acids, all right? So now very important what it is um, useful to understand is that these nutrients, they affect all three things, the structure, the synthesis, and the functioning of neurotransmitters. What are neurotransmitters? These are your chemical hormones, okay? So it is like an electric impulses which goes throughout your body, which makes you do different things, okay? And it um, also affects your mood, behavior, all of those things, okay? So those are neurotransmitters, okay? That is a little electric current, which is running across in your head, in your gut, and which is making you feel things and do things, all right? Okay, so guys, this is just an FYI to show you that there are various nutrients 
such as amino acid, B-complex vitamins, omega-3, which have been specifically, um, say, researched with specific type of mental health disorders such as major depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia. All right? So we'll be looking at these key nutrients. All right, so the first thing, as I said, we'll be looking at is omega-3. And I think in the CVD lecture, I showed you the omega-3, um, say, NRVs. Okay, so this is the same. So for um, men, the NRV is 1.3 grams per day. And for women, it is 0 0.8, omega-3, which I'm talking about. All right. So now over here, if you see roughly, 1 to 2 grams of omega-3 is recommended for healthy individuals, like for you and me. All right. But for um, patients with mental health disorders, individual research has shown that they may need as much as, say, 9 to 10 grams of omega-3. All right. For them to, say, come back the same kind of thing, okay? For them to say, combat these um, uh, mental health um, signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, so on and so forth. So basically, it's a very high amount which is needed. All right, so now when we see roughly a serve of fish, okay, so um, a cooked, say, serve of fish is approximately 100 gram, which is the size of your palm, all right? So now, what we see is that one can of um, salmon or tuna, all right, which you get in the market, one can, approximately 100 grams of serve, that has nearly, say, 1.5 gram to the tops, okay, 1.5 grams of omega-3, all right, which is, um, if you eat, you and me, healthy individuals, we will be fine, we'll get our omega-3 intake. Similarly, now you have a fresh serve of fish, which is, say, 150 to 200 grams, okay, of serve. All right, so it is double, double hands, okay, 100 and 100, all right, roughly speaking. That also will give you around, say, tops 1.5, all right? So now for patients with mental health disorder, we know they need at least 9 to 10 grams, right? So that would be like 8 to 9 cans of tuna per day. Is that like even practically possible? No, obviously it is not, all right? So then what is the other thing which um, they would be doing? They would be advised or prescribed omega-3 dietary supplementation and addition of oils. So now in addition of oils, so you have one serve of say plant-based omega-3. Okay, so now as I said that your omega-3, your plant base is your alpha linolenic acid, all right? And this is something which I covered in your last lecture if I don't believe if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I've even written over here. Oh, I'm so nice for you. Okay, so I've already written alpha-linolenic acid. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so yes, basically, um, alpha-linolenic acid, that is the vegetarian form of omega-3, all right? So for instance, um, your, um, say, handful of, um, say, walnuts. As I said, it's not a clawful, okay? It's handful. Handful of walnuts, it gives you, say, approximately 1.8 um, grams of, say, alpha-linolenic acid, okay? Flax seeds, um, for instance, they will give you, say, around, roughly speaking, say, one gram of alpha linolenic acid, okay? Look at the oils over here, okay? One tablespoon of, say, flaxseed oil, for instance, that will give you around, say, 10 grams, okay? 10 grams of alpha linolenic acid. But guys, now over here, it is very, very important to understand that not all of your alpha linolenic acid will be converted to your EPA and DHA in the body, which is, say, the um, most bioavailable form of omega-3, all right? So during, in the body, during the conversion, you will be losing a lot of, um, say, the alpha-linolenic acid, okay? So the bioavailability of, say, EPA and DHA is much lower in, say, um, vegetarian forms than, say, um, fish oils and things like that, okay? Say, fish oil supplements. All right, so roughly say you will be getting at the end around 500 to 1000 milligrams of EPA and DHA. You consume 10 grams of it, you get say around say one gram of EPA and DHA of it or maximum say 1.5 gram, all right? So much lesser, all right? So, um, so basically what am I trying to say over here at the end, the take home message is that yes, omega-3 has been very well researched, um, very difficult to get it only from your diet, say dietary sources, Yes, you will have to rely on oils and supplements, but over here you will have to be mindful about bioavailability because bioavailability of vegan sources is much more lower than in comparison to say animal sources or like fish, all right? Fish oil supplements. Now guys, this is important. This is say your uh, mechanism of conversion 
of omega-3 and omega-6 in the body. All right. So um, I had um, a student um, long time back ask me, how is this related to yin and yang? Guys, this is just an analogy which I'm using. Okay. So these are opposite in nature. Omega-6, what it does in the body is completely opposite to omega-3. So basically they are like um, two opposites. Okay. So it is like, um, say, daylight and night. All right. So it is like, yeah, the evil twin and the good twin sort of a thing. All right. So basically it's just to tell you that they have opposite functioning in the body. All right. So now we'll go on to the omega-3 mechanism. All right. So as I said, omega-3 is called as alpha linolenic acid. All right. So if you are um, having the vegan form, alpha linolenic acid is converted to eicosapentaenoic acid, docosapentaenoic acid, docosahexaenoic acid. The full form of all of this, yes, I have written it for you over here, okay? Ecosapentanoic, docosapentanoic, docosahexanoic, all right? So yes, um, it's converted to this, all right? And um, uh, some of the students, they ask me, do we need to remember um, all of these names? Well, you do need to remember ecosapentanoic acid and docosahexanoic acid, okay? EPA and DHA, why? because this is advocated so very strongly by dietitians and by health professionals that if you don't know the full form of what it means, it's pretty embarrassing, all right? So yes, as a health professional, as a health science student, you need to know this, okay? Then, so what happens, guys? So basically at each process, you have a loss of bioavailability happening, all right? So at each of this conversion, therefore, as I said, even if you are having this much, you ultimately only get this much, it is because of this conversion process, all right? Then your docosahexanoic acid is converted to eicosanoids. Now, there are three types of eicosanoids which are produced um, by omega-3, okay? So you have prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes, the full form of which I've also written for you over here, okay? So now the, prost the eicosanoids which are produced by omega-3, what type of effect it has in your body? It supports vasodilation, okay? So when you have vasodilation, you have in lowering of your blood pressure, okay? Because the surface area is increasing. Then you have decreased inflammation. So yes, it has the capacity to overall decrease your systemic inflammation. And it's a platelet inhibitor. So less clots, meaning less risk of atherosclerosis, less risk of, say, hemorrhagic strokes, all right? Things like that, all right? So yes, it is omega-3. Very, very good for heart health because of these factors. Omega-3 reduces inflammation. Reduce inflammation is very, very good for mental health as well. Okay, and we'll come to specific examples for the same. All right, now when we look at omega-6, with omega-6, you have your GLA protein. Okay, in the market, you will find a lot of primrose oil. So primrose oil is basically your GLA protein, okay, which is gamma linolenic acid. Omega-3 is alpha linolenic acid. Over here, the isomeric form is gamma linolenic acid, okay? So your omega-6 linoleic acid gets converted to gamma linolenic acid. This gets converted to arachidonic acid. Um, guys, I have to point to you that my spelling over here is wrong. So the correct spelling is written in the notes section, okay, for arachidonic acid. All right, but I don't want to redo the entire like you know slide for this so i just thought i'll make a note i'll tell you and then you do have the spelling over here okay so i haven't been mean see you have arachidonic acid so i have given you the spelling all right okay so um just let me see i'm sharing the right screen yes i am okay all good all right so then you have arachidonic acid and arachidonic acid also produces eicosanoids so what are the eicosanoids are again the same prostaglandins thromboxane leukotrienes but if you see these three babies are um, bared by omega-6 okay so these are the evil twin all right um so just um in layman terms okay so they're not really evil evil um so what it does it causes vasoconstriction okay so it increases your blood pressure then it causes platelet aggregation, meaning it increases blood clots, okay? And overall, when the ratio of omega-6 is much higher to omega-3, then it can lead to inflammation, all right? So now, guys, over here, you have to appreciate you need a balance of both. These are yin and yang. Why? Because you need a balance of both. Yes, in cases, you do need your blood pressure to go up, okay? You can't just have low blood pressure and die, okay? Even that is not good, all right? So your body, if it has a good balance of omega-6 to omega-3, 
it will increase blood pressure when needed it will decrease blood pressure when needed all right similarly with platelet aggregation you can't die of a um, hemorrhage right so you need your blood to clot so if you get a cut over here you want your blood to clot you want platelets to form so your say um, bleeding ceases okay if you don't have that obviously that would be scary all right so you need a balance of both all right so when this balance goes out of control that is when you have excessive blood pressure rise excessive blood clot excessive inflammation which is not good for cardiovascular diseases therefore omega 6 excessive in comparison to very very low intake of omega 3 can result in myocardial infection which is heart attack atherosclerosis stroke and all of those all right so yes uh, basically this is what i'm saying studies have shown that um, western diets um, easily you can obtain omega-6 but not that much of omega-3 so the ratio is highly imbalanced okay and therefore this leads to increased risk of morbidity and mortality secondary to cardiovascular diseases all right so yeah i hope it makes some um, sense guys that's just um, one mechanism okay no i admit i covered a lot more mechanisms in even the um, uh, anorexia and bulimia nervosa slide right oh well at least you have just one flowchart mechanism for this lecture isn't that good okay so i've been good kind of maybe all right it's all right <laughs> okay so now um omega-3 all right and um, how it affects your brain physiology brain functioning and therefore mental health all right um, so now over here, guys, if you see 45% of the fatty acid composition, which is there in your neurons, which are the cell of your brain, they are made up of omega-6 and omega-3, okay? So basically, all of this myelination of your, um, say, uh, the, um, the myelin sheet, so your, you have myelination of your myelin sheet, all of this has a lot of omega-3 as well, okay? Uh, and a balance of omega-6 to omega-3, all right? So basically, guys, when you have a deficiency of your essential fatty acids in general, which is both omega-6 and omega-3, this will impair the synthesis and the functioning of your neurotransmitters, okay, which is and of your neurons, all right? So your neurons will not be synthesized properly, your neurotransmitters will not be synthesized properly, and none of your neurons or, or your neurotransmitters will be working well, okay? So this is because you have an overall deficiency of essential fatty acids, such as omega-6 and omega-3, all right? Okay. Um, so yes, this is called a cerebral aging. Okay, so why EPA and DHA is so very much important for the brain because it causes cerebral aging. And why sh why should everyone be scared of cerebral aging, premature cerebral aging? Because you know the um, cells of your brain, which is your neurons, once lost are lost forever. Okay, you can't synthesize new neurons until we come up with say a stem cell therapy where we can synthesize them, like how a lizard synthesizes its tail. Um, synthesizes no grows its tail so similarly if we have the capacity of growing our own neurons um, one day that's a different story otherwise preserve what you have okay all right so then uh, what is the um say mechanism of omega-3 so as i said omega-3 is converted into eco-serpentinoic acid eco-serpentinoic acid it produces specific eco-senoids this is what we covered in the uh, mechanism my hand-drawn mechanism all right, then these eicosanoids, they produce specific neurotransmitters, okay? So these eicosanoids, they help in producing specific neurotransmitter. But remember, these neurotransmitters, the mother of these neurotransmitters is omega-3, okay? So the neurotransmitters which are synthesized using omega-3, look at the um, mouse over here, okay, which is hovering. They help you in all the positive things which is elevated mood, pleasant mood, balanced thinking, calm, happiness, positive emotions, and improvement of your memory, concentration, all of that, okay? Because the mother is a saint, okay? She is like um, the angel. So the neurotransmitters which are synthesized, they do good, okay? For the uh, brain and the mental health, all right? So um, these eicosanoids produce specific neurotransmitters via the neurosignal signal transduction pathway. That is important. So what is the neurosignal transduction pathway? This diagram over here is the neurosignal transduction pathway, meaning you have omega-3, which is, say, synthesizing 
neurotransmitters okay so it is synthesizing neurotransmitters in these vesicles all right these um, neurotransmitters are then released from the vesicles which are these little pouches over here okay so look at my mouse these are these little pouches these neurotransmitters are then released into the synapse so what is the synapse synapse is this gap between one neuron ending over here and the other neuron starting over here so you see the axion and the dendrite so look at the diagram over here axion okay and you have the dendrites all right so it is this axion and dendrites all right so um see over here so it is this this is the synaptic gap okay it's written over here synapse so this is what i want to say i want i uh, want to explain to you all right so over here the end of this and the start of this synaptic gap all right so yep you have the neurotransmitters which are released into the synaptic gap the neurotransmitters they attach to the receptor it is this u shaped thingies okay so they at attach over here and then they are taken inside uh, of the other neuron okay you have these enzymes that destroy neurotransmitter because you don't want an excess of anything so once the body thinks yes you are sufficiently happy calm peaceful and all then it will destroy the excess thing which is produced and it will tell the neuron to stop producing any more neurotransmitter okay so yes the synthesis occurs via neuro signal transduction pathway but what is important um the mother of the synthesis meaning omega 3 synthesizing these neurotransmitters okay so next you have there are um studies which came out say maybe in the 60s or 70s okay and they spoke a lot about um how dieting meaning a chronically low fat diet was associated with depression in the patients so yes it was a low fat diet patients were definitely losing some amount of weight and things but they saw that they were not happy what is what's then how is this useful right you lose weight but you're still not like happy like you know in general this is affecting your quality of life all right so obviously this is not the best way to lose weight okay so the main thing was that over here um what they saw was yes some um, very low fat diet um they saw yes they were um, lowering their plasma cholesterol levels okay by diet and medication but um, predominantly medication uh, but then what they saw was these patients were depressed so why were they depressed the main mechanism being that there was a imbalance in the omega 6 to omega 3 ratio all right so basically they were um, they showed signs of omega 3 deficiency all right so when you have very low omega 3 and you have excess of omega 6 this then triggers a lot of inflammation all right so what did they see they saw deficiency of omega 3 in cholesterol esters okay which is the storage form of cholesterol okay in the blood all right they saw deficiency of omega 3 in phospholipid what is phospholipid it is the fat which is surrounding the cell membranes okay so basically the cells were deprived of the healthy omega 3 all right they saw high ratio of omega 6 in comparison to omega 3 in the rbcs of the patient okay red blood corpus cells so what was this so basically what they saw that these rbc membranes so the phospholipid is deprived of omega 3 there is very very high omega 6 in this rbc this rbc was causing oxidative damage all right secondary to um so there were oxidative damage in the rbc secondary to omega 6 omega 6 was resulting in inflammation in itself all right so this all led to depressive symptoms in the patient okay so this is important you had oxidative damage because omega 3 triggers inflammation inflammation trigger meaning oxidative damage was triggered oxidative damage meaning damaging the rbcs okay and this led to depressive symptoms in the patients so this is how it affected mental health all right so that's why this was not advocated which is a low fat diet because it had connection with depression that is not something which is encouraged and if you remember the study i think we covered it in the obesity lecture a moderate fat diet was shown to not only help you to reduce weight but even maintain your uh, blood lipid levels okay so manage dyslipidemia as well okay so yes this is not a um, advocated way to go through because um, it is not good anyways for weight management for dyslipidemia as much as a moderate fat diet was and now we see its connection with depression essentially because um, omega 6 causes inflammation and oxidative damage 
which then results in de uh, depressive symptoms. Because when you have inflammation, guys, you have systemic inflammation which is happening, meaning your neurotransmitters are again damaged, okay, because of this inflammation. So the synthesis, production, and functioning of neurotransmitters are damaged because of the systemic inflammation, and the inflammation being because of omega-6, and therefore you have these depressive symptoms, okay? So what's the use of looking thing but not feeling happy? So no, that's not the right way to go. Okay. All right, so let's go on to amino acids. So you have tryptophan. So in the body, tryptophan is converted to serotonin. Phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine, um, which and um, you have uh, tyrosine, which is converted to dopamine. Then you have cysteine, which is converted to taurine. Okay, so at the end, you have serotonin, dopamine, taurine, which are responsible for, say, um, producing neurotransmitters, which um, make you feel happy. Okay, so because these are neurotransmitters, okay, so serotonin, dopamine, um, and uh, taurine is a non-essential amino acid, okay, but basically serotonin and dop dopamine are direct neurotransmitters. These are your happy hormones, okay, which makes you feel really happy, all right? So basically at the end, these three, they help in improving your mood, your, um, say, um, and reducing symptoms of depression, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorders, bipolar disorder, but it is all because of these neurotransmitters which are synthesized such as serotonin, dopamine, and uh, even taurine, which can elect a very calming and a happy effect. All right. Okay, so then you have um, your B-complex vitamin. So guys, this is covered in really short because as I said, extensive research in omega-3 which has been covered in great well in detail for you um, research still ongoing for amino acids and b complex so that's why it has been summarized for you crisply in this lecture okay so now the two main um, say b complex vitamins we are focusing on is folic acid and you have your methionine okay so what do they do so just remember over here you don't need to remember this uh, biochemical pathway because this is a true biochemical pathway, okay? So I don't expect you to remember this. You won't be questioned about this in your exam, all right? So um, the pathophysiological mechanisms, which I have made for you, obviously you will be questioned about those in your exam. This is just pure biochemistry. So at the end, remember folic acid helps with DNA synthesis, um, B12, okay? It helps with DNA methylation. Why are these important? So now when you have low B12 levels, you have pure, poor neurotransmitter activities. Why? Because you have poor methylation of your neurons. And you know the myelin sheet has a lot of methylation of your neurons. This is impaired because of low B12. Therefore, you have poor activity of your neurotransmitters. Second, folic acid, low folic acid, you have impaired neuron synthesis. So the neurons which are produced, they are not functioning to the best of their capacity. Why? Because folic acid is very important for DNA synthesis and DNA, as you know, is the framework, is the skeleton structure for all of our uh, body organelles, um, systems, cells, tissues, everything. Okay, so yes, when your cell is synthesized, which is your neuron, it is not functioning to the best of your capacity because of impaired DNA synthesis. All right, secondary to, to low folic acid. All right, then you have increased homocysteine levels. So of course, when you have low B12, low folic acid, you automatically have an increased homocysteine level. Why? Because of, you can see it in this diagram, why? All right, so yes, you have increased homocysteine. So why do you have increased homocysteine? Because you have, uh, say, decreased uh, methylation. Um, why? Because of your B12, all right? So what does increased homocysteine do, basically? Now you see homocysteine over here. I'll show it to you in the diagram. Why am I imagining it? Okay, so if you see over here, uh, conversion of methionine to homocysteine requires B12. Okay, B12 is essential for methylation. But now because you have low B12, high homocysteine, this will impair methylation capacity, especially of your myelin sheet. All right, and therefore you have, um, say, um, poor neurotransmittery effect and uh, membrane phospholipidia that is impaired, but basically it is poor neurotransmittery effect because of um, low B12 and high homocysteine levels, okay? Therefore, you have B-complex vitamins, which may be prescribed to mental health uh, patients if they are responsive to, um, say, the B-complex vitamins in, um, say, managing their mental health um, issues, such as, say, bipolar um, symptoms and depressive symptoms, okay? So, that is not something for you to decide independently, but it should be a, a part of the multidisciplinary team in which 
a consensus will be taken if they are B complex responsive or not. Okay, for mental health issues. All right, so then you have other nutrients which uh, we'll quickly uh, go through is, for example, carbohydrate. So now with carbohydrate, what happens when you have a complex meal which has, say, complex amount of carbohydrate, you definitely know that um, carbohydrate broken down to glucose. Glucose, when it comes in the blood, you have release of insulin. Now when you have insulin uh, which transports blood to the cell, the release of insulin also triggers the uptake of tryptophan from the blood into the brain, okay? When tryptophan goes into your brain, you know tryptophan is converted to serotonin. Serotonin is, in, is a neurotransmitter which makes you feel nice, calm and happy, okay? So yes, therefore, you have carbohydrate-rich meals which can indirectly help you feel nice, calm and happy because of this effect, because they increase the uptake of a tryptophan, which is your essential amino acid, which is converted to serotonin, okay? But this happens uh, with complex carbohydrate, okay? There's some gradual feeling of feeling nice, happy, calm, and then sleepy, okay? is because of this gradual uptake of tryptophanin, trypto, uh, tryptophan into the brain, all right? Um, and for the synthesis of serotonin. I just made a new word like tryptophanin, which is like a combination of tryptophan and serotonin. Okay, but don't do such things, okay? Basically, guys, I'm a bit tired as well. I have been uh, recording back-to-back -back lectures and meeting, but uh, don't worry, the quality of my work is not compromised in the sense of the science which I have to convey to you because I love this um, unit and the mechanisms are like the back of my hand. So trust me, I won't go wrong in communicating the messages to you. All right, so um, yes, um, now with um, increased consumption of refined carbohydrate, what happens? So this is the mechanism. So yes, um, you know brain, uh, the way it needs energy is only in form of glucose and nothing else, right? So now your brain cannot store its own glucose. It is not like the liver which stores glycogen, all right? So yes, your brain cannot stores, um, store glucose. The best way to supply energy to the brain is gradually, all right? So gradually, um, uh, by by how so when you have complex carbohydrate that's the best way to supply energy to brain why because the glucose then gradually is going into your brain brain to convert it into energy all right but now what happens when you're having refined carbohydrate okay like simple sugar this will quickly spike up your insulin you then what will have quick neurotransmitter activity meaning so much of like you know serotonin synthesized in your brain because of the spike in insulin Okay, and therefore you feel a sudden rush of being so positive, so active, so happy, you feel euphoric, but trust me, anything which is so quick will go down also so quick, so it is like a mountain shape, it's like a peak shape curve, okay, so you have a roller coaster effect, very, very high, you feel crazy, you feel happy, you feel euphoric, you feel on the top of the world, and then you have a sudden decline as well, okay. So why? Because um, insulin, so sudden um, low insulin levels in your blood, meaning sudden low, um, say, tryptophan going into your brain, sudden low shutdown of um, serotonin, okay? And this is a dose response thing, which is really sad, guys. Why? Because imagine now to have the same, um, say, euphoric experience, you need more sugar, okay, to have the same level of euphoria. Okay, so therefore it's a dose response thing. The more you um, give sugar, the more euphoria, euphoria you feel. And once you start getting, say, sensitized to that level of sugar, you need more sugar for the same level of feeling, all right? So yes, that's why ideally it is not good to have these sudden mood spikes because of, say, um, simple sugar intake because then these in the long run for mental health individuals, all right, this can result in hallucination, paranoia, delusions uh, in for schizophrenic patients, okay? Um, and um, this has seen greater number of hospitalization days as well uh, because of say um, mental health functioning. All right, so yes, refined sugar, as you know, in kids it is associated with attention deficit hypertensive disorder, ADHD. All right, so this is the reason, okay? Even so, um, it's similar, guys. It's similar to us, but of course, um, we manage it well, okay? 
so for instance uh, when you are hungry okay meaning you are hungry but you are angry as well okay you are in a grumpy mood and you have you know really low blood sugar levels and when you have some simple sugar you have a spike in your blood sugar level so spike in tryptophan spike in serotonin and after eating something you start feeling happy you can be yourself and you can start communicating like a normal human being okay it is because of this reason all right but yes as i said those are tiny little spikes okay but this constantly chronically on a long term level is not healthy all right that's why the encouragement that to for kids don't give them say sugary breakfast cereals and sugar sweetened beverages where they have these crazy spikes they can't pay attention they are so energetic and then suddenly they have a crash and they are cranky and they are moody and they are anxious and stressed and all of that it could be one of the potential mechanisms could be this all right okay then just a few more um, nutrients which are uh, say in current research okay which is vitamin c so guys in a mental health patient you see elevated levels of vanadium so vanadium is your uh, micronutrient uh, metal okay so you see that elevated level in uh, mental health patients such as bipolar patients okay which causes symptoms such as mania depression melancholy so vitamin c it protects the brain from the damage which is caused by vanadium okay the exact mechanism is still under investigation but um, for you to remember as an fyi that vitamin c will protect the brain functioning against vanadium meaning it will preserve the functioning the synthesis of your neurons and neurotransmitters which are produced via neurons okay then you have calcium so with calcium what happens you have um, a very um, common antidepressant medication which is prescribed which is called a selective serotonin uptake inhibitors ssris okay so this ssris unfortunately it inhibits calcium um, intake into the bone okay so absorption into the bone and therefore individuals who are on ssris for a very very long period of time if their dietary intake of calcium is not managed well this can result in say osteoporosis and fractures and high risk of say yeah fractures and um, bone disorders okay then you have lithium so now lithium is your gold standard mood stabilizer okay so this is more to do with psychology students but basically it is an antidepressant all right so um, what is its role so how does lithium function it increases serotonin induced neurotransmitters and you know that when you have serotonin induced neurotransmitters it is going to make you feel calm and happy so yes lithium um helps um to increase um say serotonin level which makes you feel calm and happy but the biggest side effect of lithium is that it can potentially lead to increase in weight gain now when it leads to increase in weight gain obviously the individual will be anxious and worried about having gained weight okay and this in itself will not be a very good mood stabilizer when you are anxious about your weight okay so you see the loop you see the cycle over here okay so um, yes basically what am i saying that even with medications um antidepressant medications and medications uh, for mental health it is very important to have a strong dietary management around it otherwise the side effects of medications such as calcium um, impairment of calcium absorption weight gain can further cause mental health issues in the pa uh, patient because they never want them their bodies to be impaired because of certain medicines right you want medicines to heal you not harm you okay so then um, basically uh, one of the yes this is important um how does lithium function so lithium inhibits a specific single nucleotide polymorphism snps okay snips this is called as okay which is called as gsk3b you don't need to remember gsk3b but basically what does lithium do the mechanism it inhibits single nucleotide polymorphism so what does single nucleotide polymorphism mean in simple terms i'll just share this with you so uh, for example when you have uh, you have your duplication of your chromosomes okay say from mother to child for example you always have certain minor mutation therefore the entire world the planet earth doesn't look like me or doesn't look like you okay i have a different hair structure skin structure face structure everything all right why because every one of us has a little error which causes a snip okay so meaning it could be my hair being different 
Um, then my mom, for example, my mom has uh, gray blue eyes. Okay, so the color of her eyes. I have black eyes. Um, okay, um, I wanted my mom's eyes. Okay, that's going to be a different um, chit chat which we'll be having. But basically, um, yes, so this is called SNP. My mother has a different color eyes. I have different color eyes. This is because of SNP. Okay, so in this photocopying process, you have a small little error. Majority of the time, these errors are not bad. Okay, these errors are just going to cause, say, facial variations and stuff like that, which is all accepted. This is what makes us diverse, beautiful, inclusive, all of that stuff. Okay, but sometimes when you have a SNP, which is your GSK3B, this can be associated with, say, genetic determinants of depression and bipolar disorder. So lithium helps to inhibit this. Okay, so when it is inhibiting this, then the individual is less likely to suffer from this because of the SNP. All right. So this is basically the underlying mechanism of lithium. But as I said, uh, the main thing which we are concerned with as nutritionists as well is that you don't want weight gain for that individual who then is depressed about other secondary reasons for the same. Okay. So now the last thing, guys, you have is vitamin D. Again, this is a new area of research. All right, so now with vitamin D, vitamin D helps in re reduction of schizophrenic symptoms. How? Okay, because vitamin D acts as an immunoregulator. Okay, how does it act as an immunoregulator? We will look at that. So basically in schizophrenic patients, so guys, very, very important. If you see the systemic level of inflammation in mental health patients, especially when you have severe level of, say, mental health condition, Okay, not mild or moderate, but very, very severe. In these patients, you have very high level of systemic inflammation. Okay, therefore, the role of omega-3 and all of these other nutrients. All right, but yes, when you have very high level of systemic inflammation, as seen in schizophrenic patient, what can vitamin D do? As I said, it's an immunoregulator. It is like your leukocytes, you know, how they produce the T cells and B cells. So similarly, vitamin D can act as an immunoregulator, all right? So you know how vitamin D in the body is also called as a hormone because it can actually make changes. This is one of the reasons why. Okay, so vitamin D, it decreases the synthesis of specific type of T cells, which you have well studied by now, which is your tumor necrosis factor and interleukin. Okay, you know these two T cells are highly responsible for systemic inflammation and vitamin D can actually reduce these levels. Okay, so the second thing what vitamin D can do is it can decrease the specific type of B cells which are produced. What is a specific type of B cell? Granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF. All right, don't worry, I don't um, expect you to remember this as such for an MCQ, for example. But if you had a short note, then you would be um, expected to write these things. Okay, so yes, so basically, what does vitamin D do? It decreases the specific type of B cells, which is responsible for systemic inflammation as well. And therefore, vitamin D has an immunoregulatory role, okay, because it is decreasing systemic inflammation by actually decreasing the synthesis of these inflammatory bodies. All right. So, um, and that's why, guys, what has been noted in the literature is that um, schizophrenic symptoms, they were commonly seen in individuals who have vitamin D deficiency because of high altitude, because of skin color, all right, um, dark tan individuals, okay, so like, say, brown and darker skin color, and immigrants in colder countries, for example, like Canberra, where I literally, literally get no sun, so um, yes, I, that's why I have to rely on vitamin D um, supplementations. Okay, um, not that um, I'm showing signs of this, but you may appreciate. Um, and this is, I, um, it would be interesting to share this with you. Um, not just say mental health individual guys, um, the, we have a data set from Canberra Hospital on pregnant women and around 70% of pregnant women were deficient in vitamin D. So can you imagine how prevalent this is in a region like Canberra where for six months it is so cold that you hardly are say dressed up in shorts and t-shirts and you are hardly outside because it is so freezing cold over here and that's why you are more likely to suffer from vitamin D deficiency. That is my complaint for cold and Canberra being a tropical person. I did my PhD and master's in Brisbane and I loved the weather of Queensland, what Queensland has to offer the weather. And I really miss the summers. 
but yeah we'll keep that for another not lecture <laughs> okay you'll be like she keeps telling her stories okay but yes guys that's it all right so this is our lecture and your next lecture is going to be on liver health let me prepare you liver health has some um, several new mechanisms which um, you may not be aware of because it is liver health is not as common as say obesity or diabetes okay uh, when you start studying nutrition sciences for the very first time so be well prepared for the liver health lecture because we will be covering a lot of new mechanisms as part of that lecture it's an interesting lecture at least i think it's interesting and you know i think all of this is interesting but that's a different story but um yes please um be prepared well awake uh, when you listen to the liver health lecture because there are a lot of mechanisms in that okay so yes guys that's it and um, i will see you very soon in your tutorials so let me stop this properly see you soon